Welcome to the OIS Podcast. Today, Dr. Paul Karpecki sits down with Christian Roski, CEO of Novalik. Novalik is days away from getting FDA approval of what could be a game changer for people with dry eye disease. The product uses a water-free solution that stabilizes the lipid layer for hours. Paul, I'll let you take it from here. Well, Dr. Reske, thank you very much for joining us today. It's an honor to have you. I've been lucky to know you for, well, gosh, well over a decade now. And I even remember one of the first times I'd met you and you were working on what is now Novo 3 and, you know, in prototype. And I remember touching, feeling it and thinking, this is an incredible solution, how it lasted between my fingers and, and, and the capabilities. And of course, at some point it was in and get to development. And here you are with uh, perhaps, in my opinion, the most impressive dry eye phase three data I've ever seen because you reached your pre-specified sign, symptoms, primary, secondary, all in two studies. And we're going to get into that, but I want to, first of all, thank you for making time in your busy schedule from Heidelberg, Germany to join us and help us learn about this new product that we will see from Bausch & Lohm perhaps in the new year. But I want to go back to uh, kind of your beginnings. Can you mind kind of walking us through your personal background, um, where you grew up? Were there any influences that led you to going into this level as a CEO and even your background prior to that, that allowed this path to become the leader at Novalik? Christian? So first of all, Dr. Kapecki, I mean, really thank you for the opportunity. I always love working with OIS. I think you guys do really great stuff and uh, great to be here on a podcast again. Yeah, look, my background is uh, I'm a chemist. Actually, I think even when I was eight or 10, I wanted to be a chemist. This was basically written basically in stone. I'm coming from a dynasty of chemists. My grandfather, my uncle, and my cousin, they all are academic chemists at university. But I have to say something went wrong because... um, (laughs) Actually, I I studied chemistry, I made my PhD in chemistry, and I even was close to go to Princeton. Actually, I was in Princeton to do my postdoc in the United States. And then I came, became this uh, famous phone call, but the story is more another one is uh, that I might might be the black sheep in the family because uh, I think um, there was something else in my cradle. One is I love to be a pioneer. I love to go in areas that nobody has been before, and I really enjoy that. And I think I got the spirit of an entrepreneur, I would say, from my father, because he's not a chemist. And actually, he turned down a nice position at a corporate company and became an entrepreneur. Uh, And I learned there, even when I was at school breaks, uh, working, supporting him, that when you are an entrepreneur, you have to invent yourself all the time. There is no consistency. There is no red line in life. You have to draw your own life. And it often requires disruption. I mean, personal disruption, new business concepts, and you have to enjoy that and really live it. And my father was an engineer. Well, I found iCare as my place of fun and joy, I have to say, yeah. That is really neat. So how, so that said, at the chemist background, I could see what are the legacy you had there already or on that path. And, and I love the pioneering because I think that I hear that so commonly when I'm fortunate to get to interview people who have succeeded incredibly well and lead companies. How did the eye care space come into the picture again? Yeah, look, I was in Princeton. It became this famous call, and it was basically from Abbott. And I was very keen to do something meaningful. Basically, healthcare was one of the ideas that I was running. Basically, Abbott was hiring me, and I took a position uh, in Germany. And I have to say, it was a great time for the first time, I mean, like a rookie in a new field. Um, and after two years, I felt that uh, there were not the development I would like to see. And I actually got headhunted for a company called Alcon that I didn't know. It was very funny. And uh, basically, I was running for a junior position there. I remember this, junior product manager. And I basically told them, look, guys, um, I know almost nothing about eye care. But I will move the needle. 
if I get the chance to learn and execute at the same time. And, <laughs> and actually, they took me. It made my career. I basically stayed almost 15 years at um, Archon, had a wonderful time there. I really traveled the world. I lived in Germany and Switzerland and Austria and the United States and Spain and basically left after almost 15 years as a, yeah, as a corporate executive group member before I then interestingly returned back to Abbott. Yeah, being the GM for Germany and the managing director for Central Europe. And then I have to admit was great. Uh, was another two years at Abbott. And then I have to say, um, I, I was forced to return to IKEA. I mean, it's like I, I started a role for Bausch and Lomb at that time in 2014, 15, I guess, um, again in Central Europe. I think it was nice to leave iCare, but I, I'm a returner. I think it's my everyday joy and passion. And uh, on the other hand, I think it was good to leave because you need to get the outside perspective. Otherwise, um, you... You, you always learn something new. And I would say the time at Abbott is most likely the time I don't want to miss at all because it's a highly professional company. And uh, many things that I'm applying today, I think I learned at Abbott at my two 10 years there. Makes a lot of sense. That is neat because it's true. It's one, once you're in eye care, it, either you stay in because it's so hard to leave, which is great because it's such a unique environment. Of, of physicians, of industry, of patients all working together to kind of advance, which you don't see in a lot of medical fields. At the same time, I do agree, you get that outside perspective. I think sometimes you're in it all the time. You, all you see is eye care. Uh, you either get too optimistic or pessimistic and sometimes you get outside, you can look at the whole picture and then come back into it. And then that allowed that to happen. So then the opportunity came, is it Nova League something you created and developed or had or, or what took you from habit to saying, okay, I'm going to take this entrepreneurial route now of starting up a company, no products, but going through R&D and leading that to fruition and to where we are today. Yeah, that is an interesting story because again, it started with a call. And basically one of my mentors called me, I remember this was Thierry Cletier, and he said basically something, look, uh, we're looking for a, a chemist, an expert in eye care, international experience and obviously should have some, um, um, let's say, operational experience. And we need this for a biotech company, a small biotech company to bring it to the next level. And then he said, any idea? And uh, Paul, you can imagine that um, when you are so much fixed on your, your job, you think about everything, but not about yourself. Yeah. And it took me actually a while to really understand it was not a question. It was basically a request that I basically stopped my eight years of being a GM area director. And basically he told me, look, you cannot continue to do this role for the rest of your life, but to do something meaningful, he told me. <laughs> and uh, I think it was an interesting time at Novalik. The company was already more than 10 years in business. Okay. Um, the first five years, they were basically playing around with the base technology, trying to find a niche and a spot where they can make a difference. The next five years, they basically created their first product. And then they realized, gosh, this is not a one-trick pony. This is something really big. And then the CEO at that time and the founder, Bernard Günther, he thought, I'm not the right person to lead the next level of the company. I need to find a successor. And he was reaching out to Jerry Cagle, who was on our board and still a great supporter. And basically, I call him a friend. And, um, and they phoned me up. And I think my first question was, I mean, this is amazing. I mean, the idea of replacing water and lipids with a water-free solution to overcome all these limitations, that was something that the pioneer said, gosh, there's something it's a once upon a time in your lifetime opportunity. And the second question was, hmm, this is so crazy. Is it really safe? Mm -hmm. um, because I'm a chemist and, you know, skepticism is part of our education, I would say. Yeah. But they could uh, actually convince me that, um, and we still know it today, it is safe. And I would say it's one of the 
I would say, most exciting journeys I had in my career. I started something completely new in a biotech company, coming from a major eye care leader with no background in bio, uh, in biotech. Yeah. Awesome. What a neat approach and look where you're at now and with the company and what it's been able to achieve and even just some recent announcements that came out. So tell us a little bit about this incredibly novel uh, chemical that, that we're looking at now as the base and, and opportunity in eye care um, perfluorohexaloctane, uh, I guess is kind of the background name to, to what is there. It's water-free, as you mentioned. What, what are the advantages to that and, and how does that make such an impressive uh, drop for eye care purposes that's able to achieve the kind of FDA results we're going to go into in a moment. But but tell us the unique nature of, of this uh, compound. Great question, um, because we are actually truly excited about NOVO3. I mean, I'm just coming back for, from AVO and ACRS, and for the first time, we have presented the phase two clinical trials, uh, phase three clinical trials, now to a broader audience. So what is NOVO3? Mm -hmm. So um, everybody says it's it's a first in class, but I think what's really important is a novel mode of action. We need novel mode of actions to treat the signs and symptoms of drier disease, but that are associated with myobomine gland dysfunction. And I think it's important to know that uh, we all know that drier disease is one of the most common ocular surface disorders. Um, with basically 18 million Americans already in our books that we know they have uh, the diagnosis. But MGD is really the major cause of um, the development and the progression of evaporative dryer disease, which is basically caused by a deficient tear film uh, layer that leads to increased tear evaporation. So we, we know that. So what is NOVO3 actually doing? It's, it does two things. One, it spreads on the eye very quickly and creates, I would say, as a chemist, a, a shield, really a layer, a very strong layer that protects for evaporation for hours. We have preclinical results that basically show that this layer is basically detectable for more than four hours, which is something we haven't seen with any other substance yet. And I think these are the very unique properties of this substance. So that is obviously very helpful because you have an immediate protection from evaporation of these patients. The more exciting thing that we learned over time is that NOVO3 has the ability to penetrate myobomian glands. The substance is lipophilic and it has the ability to really go into the myobomian glands. So we are still looking into what, how we can prove this in, in patients, because obviously measuring my bone and gland dysfunction is something where we lack a little bit of diagnostics, but obviously we look very much uh, forward to clinical data over a longer period of time, where we are suggesting and thinking that there will be an additional benefit from increased outflow of um, secretes from my myobomian and glands, which is the sole source of the lipid layer. So I think that makes NOVO3 so unique. And actually we have other substances in our, let's say toolbox that interestingly don't penetrate in my bombing glands or that don't build this kind of layer. So it's really unique to perfluorohexyl octane. And I would say um, clinical data doesn't lie. And as you say nicely, um, we were really, truly excited. Um, we were running a phase two clinical trial. We called it the CKS trial back in 2019. And now obviously we have much more data. There were recently the two phase three trials that were completed, Gobi and Moyava that we did in co collaboration with Bauch and Lomb. And they, I mean, they met all primary and secondary endpoints, all. And um, so what I think is very important in dry eye disease is, is really consistency, which is really the key goal of our products to deliver this kind of consistency. And we only see consistent data in multiple areas um, in all our clinical trials with NOVO3. And so obviously um, that is something we are 
now moving forward because the treatment options for dry eye disease associated with myobiomian gland dysfunction, and you know this, in particular in the United States are, are truly limited. There are mechanical methods that we all know very well from, um, let's say, medical devices, a number of different um, mode of actions. Warm compressors are very, um, very um, common, lid scrubs and so on. But uh, if approved, uh, we really think that NOV or 3 would offer the eye care professionals a very promising and new um, topical pharmaceutical approach for these patients. And um, that I think is one of the hopefully game changers we will see in dry eye disease with so many patients that we cannot serve appropriately right now. I think you're spot on, Christian. You think about the fact that uh, it is the majority of dry eye it has some MGD component. Studies by Lamp and others have suggested, you know, over 85%, and that's a significant number. It also is very unique in the sense that we have a lot of RX drugs approved currently that are anti-inflammatories, but nothing targeting the cause of the disease. And so many times the cause is going to be, well, MGD. So this is really one of the most unique agents to do that. And it is unheard of to have a drug that can maintain an effect, almost like a lipid replacement even for four hours and do that for these patients that have no other way. They're, they're having evaporative processes happening all day long because of the, the situation. They often wake up in a bad spot. It only progresses over time and late in the day for those uh, common patients. And now you're getting this extended period of time to, to replace it, to allow it to function. And as we talked about, there's a significant number of all dry eye forms that have meibomian gland dysfunction. Even some of the most severe forms of dry eye eventually have meibomian gland breakdown as well, because it is as Flugfelter and Stern and others have coined this lacrimal functional unit. And I'm hoping that obviously that it gets recognized that you have to treat the inflammation. That's okay, but you have to treat the cause too. And we're finally going to have an agent that will allow us therapeutically um, to do that, which is which is very exciting. And so you and Bausch Shalom have done a great job. And to just to emphasize a key point is it, you know, most dry eye studies have required a minimum of four phase three pivotal trials, the two, one for symptoms and then confirmatory, another for signs and then confirmatory. Some have even had subgroups even beyond that. You achieved your pre-specified primary endpoints for signs and symptoms in two studies. That is really a remarkable feat. And I think that creates some wonderful um, excitement. Now, of course, the, the file for an IND, I guess, is not too far along given this uh, closing of your FDA trial data, which is so impressive, plus a great safety profile to go along um, with it. So is that's all in the works. And now Bao Shalom will be the uh, US uh, distributor, marketer, all of those steps. Is that kind of how it works, Christian? Yeah, exactly. We license the product to a Bausch and Lomb. And I have to say, we are really working very hard to bring this innovation to patients in the United States. And um, yeah, the collaboration with Bausch is, is really a, a great success story. Um, many people were asking me, look, this is a big product. Why do you license this ours yeah? um, to a leader? Yeah, And uh, I, I think, first of all, with the relationship with Bausch is... Um, we really enjoy a high level of trust and confidence yeah, between both sides. And I think that's uh, that's interesting because I, I've been working in these major companies and now you have a small biotech company somewhere in the middle of nowhere in Heidelberg. Yeah, It's nice, we have a romantic <laughs> castle, yeah. But um, I think what we all learned um, is water-free therapies are not trivial. And in particular, um, really Bausch and Lomb isn't really enjoying the huge CMC, this is a chemistry manufacturing and um, experience that we have and with all the supply chain partners. So we are really providing an essential piece of the uh, submission. On the other hand, as you say, um, uh, this is a very big and novel indication. We have established anti-inflammatory therapies, um, but now dry eye disease associated with myobiomian gland dysfunction is a, is a totally new opportunity. And uh, I thought, and I think Bausch is in the same opposition, that um, this really requires a leading ophthalmic player with a yeah, legacy in eye care that is dedicated to eye care and has really the commercial and financial capabilities. My strength is R&D. The strength from Bausch & Lomb is really commercialization of these products, and I can help them with a the pipeline. 
and they can uh, help us to bring this product to to the patients. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would say um, we are not only counting weeks, I think we are counting days <laughs> because uh, we actually uh, look forward to submitting NOV03 for um, FDA approval during the second quarter. And you know, we are already in May. Uh, so you can expect something, I would say fairly soon. That's very exciting and something we can certainly use for our patients, I'll be closely watching that. Now, speaking of R&D, where your strengths are at and what you've been able to accomplish, can you tell us a little bit about the, the next uh, exciting molecule, you know, unique aspects of cyclosol um, and where that technology stands today uh, in clinical trials, which also has shown some great results, but um, how is that different and, and, and where's that molecule currently? Yeah, cyclosol is com the completely, let's say, opposite of NOV03. So cyclosol is a fast-acting, anti-inflammatory, immunomodulating ophthalmic solution that contains uh, cyclosporine. And we selected 0.1% uh, of cyclosporine, but we are putting this in our water-free vehicle. And that is being developed, again, for the treatment of the signs and symptoms of dry disease. So many people were asking me, Christian, why do you take cyclosporine? That's already on the market. I mean, it's even now generic and it burns and it stings. I mean, I mean we have good results with uh, these cyclosporine products, but obviously we see all the, the side effects. Yeah? And I think it's so exciting that um, cyclosporine is really the right, uh, let's say, drug for, the, for, the, for treating the ocular surface, but uh, putting this in our technology platform of ISOL, it really unfolds the full potential of the API. So I give you some data that we found in our recent clinical trial that I think is very consistent what we found earlier, but that really tells the story. So we see significance already after 15 days, two weeks. We basically found that more than 70% of the patients are showing a clinically meaningful improvement in total corneal fluorescein staining at four weeks. Not significant in the respect of that we have a difference between vehicle. I mean, that's important for regulatory purpose. No, I'm talking clinically meaningful. I think that's important, something that is really providing a clinically meaningful improvement of the ocular surface. Why is this so important? I mean, we all know we got teach by, yeah, like Steve Flugfelder and Mike Stern, whom I met again at uh, AVO. I mean, we learned that progressive cornea surface damage secondary to dryer disease can lead to visual impairments and is really has a huge impact on daily activities for our patients and they required visual attention and have struggles with reading and driving activities. On top of that, as you know, cornea surface damage can also have a negative effect on visual outcomes that are linked to surgeries, like cataract surgery, LASIK surgery. I mean, there, there are multiple guidelines that are recommending treatment of the cornea surface, secondary to dryer disease, prior to these kinds of procedures. So we think now we have a tool that can potentially do the job. And uh, we also found that patients with high central staining showed superior relief of blurred vision in the cyclosol group compared to a vehicle. And the overall fact that um, this product is again, like NOVR3, very terrible, uh, very little side effects. And in fact, that almost 80% of the patients rated satisfaction either at positive or neutral really displays that we have an excellent safety and durability profile, something that um, I would say patients, eye care professionals, and payers are looking forward in the category of anti-inflammatory uh, therapies. So yeah, I think we are honestly very excited about um, this kind of um, development because we see really a high unmet medical need um, for a rapid, consistent, but safe and sustained comfortable treatment uh, for uh, inflammatory dry eye disease. And yeah, again, as you said, our phase two trials, we did two, they support 
an NDA, NDA uh, submission. We just came back from a pre-NDA meeting with uh, FDA uh, by the end of March. And um, I would say in parallel to the work we're doing with NOVR3, we are working now on submitting an NDA for Cyclasol and we are actually anticipating to submit in July. I mean, this year, not next year. <laughs> so it's actually two, two submissions in parallel. So uh, it's a busy time, but the times cannot be more exciting. That's really exciting to have two new drug applications. Wow, at the same time. And I agree, you know, we have to admit sex porn is a very effective agent. We've seen that, but it could use some improvement. And it seems like you have been able to achieve that in multiple fronts, including the speed of effect, tolerability, effects on vision, staining, and all the exciting components that'll come out with this data as well, which is great. So what's in store next, Christian, for Nova Leak? You, I mean, I don't know, you could do much more than having two NDAs filed at the same time uh, this year, June, July, the sort of thing. Uh, what, what does the company do at, uh, from this point on? So how much time do you have? <laughs> I Only mean, a few more minutes here, but- Exactly, I, I mean, uh, let's, let's cut it down. I mean, <laughs> so it's really, it's like, it feels like that we are in the infant steps of, uh, we call it a new drug category. I think what we, what we have seen with all our development, it works. Water-free is potentially a new standard or maybe gold standard that we are going to appreciate in the next uh, years to come. And we believe there are many opportunities. Uh, we just actually completed a glaucoma trial, a phase two trial. Not people, many people know about that. Um, we evaluated two beta blocker molecules in our technology that would really greatly benefit um, from a preservative-free, because you know, water-free is always preservative-free by definition, nothing can grow in a water-free solution. And actually a microdose topical application. Remember that our technology, we can customize the drop size. So we basically work with 10 microliters to avoid overfilling the eye. So we expect uh, a bit too early this podcast here, but we really expect top line data um, from this more than 200 patient trial in, I would say very soon, likely uh, already in May. So what's next? I mean, if you think about a biotech company, um, our mission is to be a pioneer. So we believe we should focus on breakthrough innovations. Um, actually, we have a program that we are getting very excited about. We have a number, but I just want to mention one here that uh, we are utilizing the unique properties of biomolecules in our technology. So moving from small molecules to biomolecules. And we are targeting um, let's say areas in ophthalmology there where we see still a high unmet medical need, in particular diabetic retinopathy with a topical therapy. Sounds crazy. Uh, there's definitely high risk, but the first preclinical results that we have been seeing are actually promising. But obviously we need a bit more time and work to talk about this in public. On the other hand, I would say there are so many opportunities to develop a wide range of water-free topical products. That is actually not a priority to us as a biotech company, but we believe that would provide a lot of value to patients. So here we really think uh, we should cooperate, and collaborate um, with a strategic partner to really drive a portfolio and a number of developments in areas that most likely are not suitable for a biotech company, but for companies to provide a portfolio and to prov provide in a um, short period of time, a lot of value to patients. So I would say, when you say what's more in store, you need to stay tuned because in my I mind, I mean, water-free therapies in eye care are likely not an exception or limited dry eye disease. But uh, obviously, they have uh, likely a bright future, and we are working on many, many areas at the same time. I agree with you. They do have a bright future. They're so novel. I mean, even the, my, the dose of 12 microliters versus the 30 to 50 we're putting in today, the fact you can barely feel them and they go into the eye, they're water-free, they're naturally preservative-free, uh, the effects, the tolerability, how, you know, how effective they are, but also how comfortable. It is a very amazing molecule. Congratulations, and great to see so many more applications coming through for it. But you're going to start with a big market right away. 
uh, should you get a labeling that allows for uh, signs and symptoms, which you hit uh, for dry disease in patients with MGD. And I love that you are that specific in the category. I think that's going to be very helpful for all of us and for the drug. Last question, and it's got a few minutes, but you've really been through an incredible path. You, uh, from big companies, big ophthalmic companies like Alcon, and obviously big, huge companies like Abbott outside of the industry, um, to then a, a biotech kind of startup that you've led. You know, so what pearls of wisdom for those of our listeners that, that aspire to achieve success in leading a ethalmic company in any one of those spaces uh, could look to? And what words might you have for them to help them uh, in that path as far as what's allowed you to be so successful uh, today? Good question. Um, so let me throw in uh, two words and then let me explain there. I think one is, is collaboration and the other is market access because I think both will determine the future success in eye care. So let me explain. I mean, I mean, we are an R&D company. So um, we are typically great in innovate, as an innovator. We innovate. That's basically our goal. Yeah? So we develop breakthrough innovations, or we hope so. We take risk. Um, and um, obviously, we are not very strong in commercializing products. So that typically leaves uh, when a product comes closer to approval, basically two options. Yeah? We can basically um, license the product to a strategic or we can uh, build our own commercial capabilities basically from scratch, which I think is uh, typically a challenge because it's not our core competency. Yeah? So I think uh, to provide value uh, to patients and to um, physicians and the community, I think what um, is important is collaboration. Yeah? I see this very much in R&D, but I think there's, um, if I would look in the future, I think there are many more opportunities when it comes to uh, commercial collaborations for the benefit of serving patients and bringing products faster to, to really, to, not to the market, but really to patients out there. Because small companies are, are limiting their capabilities and on the other hand, there are so many great ideas that um, potentially um, need to serve. Yeah. And the other thing is that I learned as a European is, is market access. The Americans, when I come to America, now everybody's concerned about payers. I mean, they talk about glaucoma generics, and they talk about obviously stasis generics, and they're all very concerned. And I say, look, I'm used to that. I, I grew up in the payer, let's say, uh, market already in the early. 2000, yeah. And any company, even if it's biotech and they're starting a phase one um, project, they need to make that a priority at any time. And obviously, latest when they are coming in a, at a later stage development. Why? Um, some people say, oh, I just only go for out of pocket drug development products. So I'm avoiding the payers. I don't think vision is priceless. So payers will always play a role and payers will they make their contribution. But uh, I think what we have been not good at is to really put a price tag on our innovation. Is it really better what is already out there? How do we prove that? How do we demonstrate economic value and healthcare value? And um, because that's what it's all about. That's a lesson that I learned uh, in Europe and that we as a company already adapt for the United States. And there's one thing that I, in my mind is very clear is we will do many more clinical trials. Right now, we just do clinical trials for approval. That's not enough. To really achieve um, the right and fair coverage with payers requires post-approval trials that really show uh, you are inferior, superior, or where are you? What kind of value are you going to provide? So this comes back to uh, what I said is, I think on one hand, small companies need um, partners because not everything we can do on our own because many things cannot be paid only by money. On the other hand, this, this space has to innovate because we're getting challenges now from yeah, from payers that basically restrict access to pay, to products that are already approved. So I would say, if you want to start in IKEA right now, it's the best time to start because again, there will be a lot of change, many opportunities for smart people, and uh, as we all know, people make the difference, and uh, it's all about us 
to bring that change to our space. Thank you, Christian. That was fantastic. Those insights at the end are so valuable to so many listeners, even those companies who may have a company, a product in drug development right now that are, are thinking about how do we cover, get through this access barrier, so to speak. And those insights were absolutely brilliant. I love the collaboration and of course the market access. That's not one that's come up. And yet, if you think about how important those two components are, they really do spell the difference between a success at some level and extreme success. And, and I think you, you hit it perfectly. So I appreciate that. I thank you for all the time, the great insights for sharing so much that'll help other companies and other entrepreneurs. And I also congratulate you on achieving incredible milestones. Uh, and the great thing is they were just achieved. I mean, this press release looking at it was just from a few days ago. And so we can't get any quicker of an interview and, and here you are making time for this. And uh, congrats, great work done. Uh, two NDA filings coming up momentarily, uh, two very exciting drugs and, and one that's gonna capture a space that we're in desperate need of. So we're grateful for you and your time and congratulate you and, and the company Novalik and your entire team that's done such a good job. We're honored to have you today on OAS. Thank you so much, Paul. Very nice words. And um, I have to say, we are very happy to work with OIS. They have put us on stage when nobody knew us. And I think uh, OIS is definitely part of that success story. We learned new people, we networked with so many supporters. I mean, we enjoy really a big group of um, yeah, investors and clinicians and, and yourself that really are giving us advice, hard times to make our products better. And I would say these kind of discussions and the forum is something that is so rich. And uh, I would say if this is the only wisdom, I would say that is the most important thing that people come together and uh, talk about solving problems. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Have a great time. See you soon. Thank you for listening, everyone. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the OIS podcast. Be sure to listen in next week as we discuss the latest innovations in ophthalmology with experts in science, medicine, and industry. Subscribe to our iTunes channel so you don't miss a thing. Got a story of your own to tell? Apply to be a guest at ois.net.